Something I love about London is how so much English history kind of happened here. All the famous kings and queens, all the great figures you've heard about in English history, they probably came to London at some point, and there's probably a plaque on the house they stayed in so you can go and visit it. Even people famously associated with the not London parts of England, like Yorkshire lass Charlotte Bronte, she has a portrait at the National Portrait Gallery and a memorial at Westminster Abbey. Those famous Liverpudlians, the Beatles, recorded their albums at Abbey Road in London, performed their last concert on Savile Row in London, and lived at multiple houses in London. But if you're in London looking for Viking history, you might find yourself a little bit stuck. There's no big Viking museum, or living history site, or famous building built by the Vikings. Romans, we got an amphitheatre. Saxons, we got your Sutton Hoo finds but no equivalent for Vikings in London. And that can be a problem, because Vikings are one of the big important parts of English history that all children must learn about by law in the national curriculum. So today we're going to talk about why Vikings have left so little trace, and then I'm going to tell you where you can still find some clues to their presence, if you know what you're looking for. Some proper insider knowledge. So, where have all the Vikings gone? So to talk about why Vikings are so hard to find, we first have to talk about the people who were here already when the Vikings got here, who we call the Saxons. People from the area around modern-day Germany had been coming to England in dribs and drabs for hundreds of years, since at least the 6th century. We call them Saxons after Saxony in Germany, and specifically they were English or Anglo-Saxons as opposed to Old Saxons who stayed in Germany. As far as we can tell, they weren't a big invading army, they were a few boatloads of settlers and farmers turning up every year, until by the 8th and 9th centuries, they were the main group of people in England. They give England its language. Almost all of the top 100 most common words in English come from this period. They give us the word England, and most of our place names. And then, in the 9th century, they start getting attacked by people from Norway and Denmark, who we call Vikings. Now, later in the period, people from Scandinavia are coming here peacefully to trade and settle, but especially in the beginning, these are raiding parties. Hit and run attacks on markets and monasteries, where there's a lot of portable loot around that isn't very well defended. They've got really fast ships, so they can be in and out before the locals can put together an army to defend themselves. Viking longships are the best in the world. They're shallow keels and wide bottoms, allowing them to traverse oceans as well as shallow rivers. They are very fast, and can go far inland, which makes them perfect for surprise attacks on cities on rivers. And that's what happens in London. In 851, Vikings pillage Canterbury, and then sail down the Thames with 350 ships to attack London. This must be happening a lot, because in 886, Londoners living in what is now Covent Garden get fed up with being attacked from the river all the time, and move into the old Roman walled city next door. Their king, Alfred the Great, puts a lot of money into shoring up the walls and making them properly defensive. So although Vikings are here, and having a massive impact on London, at first they're not really putting down buildings that might last until today, or becoming part of the political power structure. But over time, the Vikings get really good at these raids, and they start raiding further and further inland. And if you're inland, you need to set up a camp between you and your boats. And if you're camping, you need food, so you might start going to the local market. And eventually you start getting so good at it that you camp over the whole winter in England. And then maybe you decide the pickings are so good that you're not going back in the spring, and maybe you'll stay a bit longer, and bring the wife and kids so they're not left alone, and start blending in more to local life. And maybe you stop calling yourself a Viking, which means something a bit like a, a pirate or a raider, and start calling yourself just a Dane, or a Northman. Vikings and Saxons are already pretty similar, like a Viking comb, for example, might not look too different to a Saxon one. A Viking's house will look pretty similar to a Saxon's house. When archaeologists dig these things up, there's not always any way of telling if they belong to a Saxon, or a Viking who was only staying over for a season, or a Dane who had settled here and made a family. 
There are certain kinds of objects where you can see a difference. There are stylistic differences in some kinds of weapons and jewellery, for example. So some objects, archaeologists can confidently say are Viking, but not in everything. Their languages were pretty similar too. Today we call the Saxon language Old English and the Viking language Old Norse. And although they are different languages, if you speak slowly you can probably get by at market. They're both Germanic languages. But in London it's Saxons who retain state power. London's kings are Saxon. Vikings do take over and rule a part of England in the north, called the Danelaw, for years. But there are only a few years where London has a Viking king, from Sven Forkbeard in 1013 to his grandson Hath Knut in 1042, with a bit of the Saxons coming back in the middle. So we say that everything we find from that period is from the Saxon period, even if it might have been owned by someone who wouldn't call themselves Saxon. This means that unlike in the north of England where Vikings rule for a long time and put down roots and transfer their culture, here in London their presence is felt a lot less strongly. You see this most clearly in place names. You can spot the Saxons where places end in Ham, like Ickenham, Amersham, Chesham and Balham, and indeed plain old West Ham and East Ham, in Ing, like Barking, Ealing, Epping and Havering, and Tun, like Islington, Paddington and Kensington. Whereas Viking place names, ending in things like Be, Thwaite and Thorpe, are much rarer. You'll find plenty of Scunthorpes, Haxbys and Micklethwaites up north, where the Vikings were more powerful, but they're less common in and around London. Having said that, there are some Viking things you can find in London. They don't always have a nice obvious sign on them, you have to know what you're looking for. Which is what I'm here for. Viking things you can see. Museums. There are two big London museums you can head to to see Viking stuff. The Museum of London has a case of Viking objects in their medieval gallery. You can see some axes and swords and a gravestone with runes on it that you can still read. Ginna had this stone laid and with Toki. And there's the British Museum, which if you head to their room 41, you'll find Viking jewellery, including this frankly ridiculous brooch from Cumbria. Like from the from the picture, it looks like a fancy version of my basic penannular brooch, but this one is a whopping 51 centimetres long. It's like a whole sword you're wearing as a piece of jewellery. Sorry, Ella. No weapons at this feast. It's strictly peaceful. Weapons? Oh, you mean my brooch? Oh, but this is jewellery. My grandmother gave this to me. Are, are you calling my grandma a liar? They also have the Lewis chessmen. No one knows exactly where these chess pieces come from, but they're definitely Viking. If you take a look at the rook pieces, you'll see they're in the shape of these funny pointy-hatted men biting their shields. These are berserkers, a particular kind of Viking warrior who works themselves up into a frenzy before battle, possibly with drugs, so they end up doing mad things like biting their shields and believing they'd turn into bears or wolves. A saga writer from the period says berserkers wore no armour, and were as mad as dogs or wolves, bit their shields. Neither fire nor iron could kill them. The British Library have some beautiful illuminated manuscripts from the reign of the Viking King Canute, uh, Canute's Law Code, a monastery book called the Newminster Liber Vitae, with a picture of Canute and his Queen Emma, and a book about Emma, the Ecomium Mi Reginae. Uh, as far as I know, none of these are out on display, but they are fully digitised on their website, so you don't even have to get up. Churches. Okay, I know that trekking around a load of small churches sounds really boring, but hear me out, some of them have great stuff. St Catherine's, near Regent's Park, caters to the modern-day Danish community, and in their back garden they have a replica of one of the yelling stones. Uh, not yelling as in shouting, but yelling as in the Danish town of yelling. These are huge runestones in Denmark that mark the country's official conversion from Viking pagan religions to Christianity, and depict Christ on a very wiggly looking cross. The originals are of such historic and cultural value that they were officially made a UNESCO World Heritage Site like Stonehenge or the Taj Mahal. All Hallows by the Tower claims to be the oldest church in the city. And if you go into their basement, you can see gravestones that still have runes carved into them. Unlike at the British Museum, this isn't behind glass. 
And although you shouldn't touch them, just having that layer removed can make such a difference in how you relate to an object. Someone made this a thousand years ago. They chipped all those letters by hand. There are also churches with Viking connections, like St Olav's Heart Street. St Olav, or Olaf, is a Norse saint, but how did he get a London church named after him? Well, in the year 1002, the Saxon king is this guy called Athelred, meaning well-advised. But he makes some really bad, no good, terrible decisions, so his nickname is badly advised or unready. It's very funny if you speak Old English. Now, he's getting pretty sick of Vikings coming over here and raiding, so he orders a massacre of Danish settlers in retaliation. We don't know how many are killed, but when the Danish king, the fabulously named Sven Forkbeard, finds out about it, he declares that vengeance will be swift. The raids come faster and heavier than ever before. He harries England and drains it of resources for ten years, to the point that there are more English coins from this period found in Denmark than in England. Finally, in 1013, Sven Forkbeard comes with an invading army and takes over the whole country. Athelred flees to Normandy, and Sven Forkbeard is crowned King of England, and his son after him, who generations of school children have been delighted to find, is called Canute. But Athelred isn't beaten yet. The story goes that he teams up with a Norwegian called Olaf Haraldsson. Like Vikings for hundreds of years before them, together they sail up the Thames towards London until they come to London Bridge. On the bridge are Canute's forces defending the city. They've got the high ground looking down on Olaf and Athelstan's forces. But Olaf has a clever plan. Instead of trying to fight from a boat, they tie ropes around the bridge and row back the way they came as fast as they can. The bridge crumbles into the river with all Canute's troops on it, and Athelstan takes back the city. Today you can still find things named after Olaf Haraldsson in London. There's St Olaf's Church on Hart Street, which was Samuel Pepys' church, and St Olaf House on Tooley Street, where there's a funky little mosaic of him. And Tooley Street itself is a corruption of St Olaf. St Tooley... Tooley? Bit of a weird one. And finally, a bit of a mystery stop, there's also St Clement Danes on the Strand. It obviously has a connection with Danish people, otherwise where would the name come from? But we don't quite know what that connection is. Maybe it was founded by Vikings, or for the Danish settlers in London. St Clement is the patron saint of mariners, so it would make sense for a seafaring people. Maybe there were some famous Danish people buried there early in its history. So you'll notice that these places are all quite small and spread out across London, which is why you won't find anyone who can take you on a Viking-themed walking tour around the city. But if you know where to look, with a practised eye, you can find them scattered about. I hope this helps you in your own quests for Vikings, whether you're studying them in school or later in life.